My guest today is Al Rodriguez. Al, how are you today? Hey, I'm pretty good. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, what do you do for a living, Al? Uh, well, I am a uh, software developer by trade. Um, I kind of go back and forth on a couple of different roles. Uh, my current role uh, is at Microsoft. I'm in a uh, customer support kind of role uh, with uh, uh, enterprises on, uh, on Azure. Excellent. I'm at Microsoft myself. <laughs> All right, uh, now, I... I invited you on the show because I saw you give an excellent presentation on managed identities at Beer City Code in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I wanted you to, to share that knowledge with the world. What's, um, well, let's start with definitions. What is a managed identity? Yeah, so a managed identity is an abstraction within Azure to let you connect to something without having to maintain the secret, right? So I think we're all very used to something like a connection string or a to an access token of some kind, right? And so we have to maintain that value, right? Like, hey, what's what's that secret? Where, where are we going to store it? How are we going to keep track of that? And so Azure has this cool nifty feature, Manage Identities, uh, to let you go ahead and just kind of set up the permissions and say, you, Azure, you go ahead and, and do all that stuff I don't like dealing with, right? I don't want to, I don't want to cycle the the secret or any of that stuff. Uh, you just go ahead and and do that. I'll do the the you know work of setting what those permissions are. But after that, uh, it's it's just like everything else, right? It's it's the same permissions as just like if you did have that token, uh, because actually under the hood, uh, it is still using tokens. Uh, it's just doing all of the work that you as a person would do anyway. Okay. Now, I know that um, I, I think most of us are smart enough not to put things like connection strings and uh, token values and passwords in our source code repository, uh, but we'll, we'll move them somewhere else. Is that, uh, are, if, if we continue to do that, we don't mind the work? Is that is that a bad thing? Yeah, it's it's not it's not just that it's it's bad to, to hold on to that, right? Like there, you know, I, I think what happens with a lot of, of uh, you know, sensitive things like that is it's it's scary when something could happen to it, you know? Okay. Uh, so I think an, an example is, you know, think about the, the blast radius, right? So if you have uh, this sensitive value, right? This access token, connection history, whatever it is you want to want to think of. And uh, somehow it accidentally leaks, right? Like maybe, you, yes, you are smart enough to not check it into source control, but it's possible it could happen, right? Oh, okay. And so if that does happen, how bad is it in the moment, right? How how easy is it for you to to find that, to notice that quickly? Uh, and then how much work is involved in fixing that, right? Like, uh, you know, that example of checking it into source control. Uh, is, is this uh, public source control, right? Something like GitHub that anyone can access? Or is it internal? Uh, and it's, you know, still kind of bad, but it's not it's not something you want, right? But there's still a, a step or a couple of steps involved in, you know, re removing that from your Git history and that kind of stuff. And so, uh, you know, it's one of those things that's just kind of safe. Uh, it's another level of safety that we kind of want to okay. go ahead and, and add to to our software development practices. So by doing this, we're reducing the risk uh, beyond what, uh, even if we're very careful, that's, that's one thing we don't have to be as careful about because somebody else is, assuming that risk for us. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Right. Like it's it, so many of the things that we do uh, in, in software development and technology in general, right. Are, are people problems. And it's yeah. so easy for an individual person to make that mistake. Like I know I've made that mistake multiple times. Uh, and I know this because I've learned recently, apparently GitHub has gotten a lot better at trying to stop you from uploading tokens to, right. uh, to uh, yeah your repositories sure uh, and which is great that that's awesome like I'm I'm so glad that that's that feature is there but uh, you know it's still possible to check something in that you you don't want yeah I've also and, even retroactively I noticed that uh, my employer <laughs> will, will go through <laughs> regularly and scour my source control and find any secrets that are checked in there and sometimes I just do put demo code up there 
you know, I have mm -hmm. a connection to a resource on Azure that I've long since deleted. There's zero risk of it, but I still get these emails scolding me for having it there. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'd rather have that email than, yeah. than not have it, right? I agree. <laughs> All right, well, let's get back to yeah. then. Okay, so I think we're, uh, we're, you've convinced me that managed identities are a good thing. Let's, let's talk more detail about exactly what they are. Yeah. So, okay. So let's, let's do, I guess, a little, little history, right? So you want to think like, you know, let's say in the past, you know, pre-cloud, right? Everything was on-prem. Uh, and then I guess still today for everyone who's, who's not, you know, using fun cloud stuff, right? So you're on some machine and I'm going to say a Windows machine just because I know how to manage that a lot more than, than hosting on, on Linux, right? So uh, if you have an application and you're going to go ahead and have some kind of secret for connecting to some external service, right? Again, whatever that is, access token, connection string, et cetera. So you would have to store that somewhere, right? And then the application gets it at that, that proper time, right? And so uh, kind of the traditional thing was to make a service account. And so this was like a user, it, you effectively had a user password, uh, on the box itself. And so then that box would then get certain permissions to do certain things, right? So uh, an example of something that I would see often is like, hey, let's uh, have this account that can uh, talk to this machine on the network, right. you know, th things like that, right? Uh, and so that was the, the, that was the service account. Yeah. So fast forward to, you know, what we have today in, in the cloud, uh, we have um, basically the same concept. We have service principles and, uh, and it, I think uh, I probably kind of skipped over. I just want to say uh, everything that I'm saying about this is specifically to Azure. So this is not uh, something for, you know, your app in Azure talking to some other cloud. This is, this is just, you know, app in Azure talking to other uh, Azure services. So anyway, back to the whole service principle thing. Uh, so your, your service principle, uh, same concept as what I mentioned on-prem, right? Except now instead you're specifying what are the roles, what are the permissions that this account has when talking to other services hosted within Azure? So an example would be, um, you know, I have a web application that needs to talk to uh, something like, let's say, uh, blob storage, right? You're going to host some files. Now, these are internal files that only your application uses, right? They're not going to be something that you want publicly accessible for anyone to go ahead and use. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to your blob storage and you're going to lock it down and you're going to say, okay, these are internal. Uh, no one can just access it. Even if they, even if they have the URL to get to it, they should not be able to, to access it. And so you're going to set up the permissions for this service principle and say this service principle can go ahead and read files from there and write to them. Sure. You know, read, read and write. Let's go ahead and edit those files. So now that the service principle has those rights, you then need to say, my app over here is using that service principle, right? So the app then gets an identity and then the identity has whatever permissions it is that you want it to be able to do. And the service principle is, is kind of the, the underlying architecture for a managed identity. So one of the downsides of a service principle is it's complex. Uh, I think uh, as I was learning Azure cloud stuff years ago, I relearned the concept of a service principle like three or four times because I just kept forgetting, right? right? I would I would make one, I would go to like a, a separate view in uh, Azure AD or Entra now that it's called, and I would kind of fumble my way around and realize, okay, this is how I create it. Uh, this thing will give me a client secret and uh, okay, cool, I think I have it. And then a couple months would go by and I would go back to that screen and realize I forgot everything. Uh, it's not a lot of stuff. It's just something you hardly use. <laughs> so That's the purpose of my blog, by the way, is <laughs> reminders to my future self of mm -hmm. things that I used to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, you know, that's the, the big benefit of, of having a blog. Um, but the uh, that that only works if you remember to blog things, yeah. <laughs> which which I found, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So anyway, so that's the the service principle, and you know all of the all of that hard annoying stuff, I guess, about the service principle uh, is the stuff that the managed identity abstracts us away from. Okay. So you don't have to uh, go ahead and you know manage the the lifespan or sorry the uh, 
the lifetime of the service principle. So, you know, one of the examples is when you create a service principle, yeah, you, you give it permissions to do certain things, but you also have to create like a, a timed password, right? That, that password or client secret, as it's called, only exists for, or will only be valid for a certain amount of time. So uh, in days, and I, I forget what the maximum length is, there is a maximum length. It's, it's something like six months, nine months, some, something to that effect, right? So you have to maintain that, you know, as a person managing right. whatever application. You have to remember to, to change it or to renew it mm -hmm. before yeah. it expires. Exactly. Yeah. And there's nothing uh, built into Azure, unfortunately, to tell you. So, you know, if you don't make a, a reminder, you will be reminded. And your users will be it. screaming at you, the, the <laughs> application bro. Exactly. Yeah, that's your reminder. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's one of the, the, the kind of harder uh, things when dealing with service principles. So uh, the managed identity makes that easy because what you do is you, you say, hey, I'm making a managed identity on my service. And now I'm just going to go ahead and give permissions to the service. And then Azure takes care of that that hard stuff for you. Right. So it's uh, it's still making tokens um, under the hood. It's still uh, making sure that only your app is using them uh, and, and, and that kind of stuff. Right. So it's it, you know, that's that's the managed word in managed identities. Right. It's, it. it's someone else taking care of that stuff that you, you probably shouldn't really have to because we live in a uh, world where we get to automate things. And that's nice. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that uh, the scenario you're describing is Azure only. You've got one mm -hmm. uh, one Azure resource talking to another Azure resource. What if I'm mm -hmm. going outside of Azure, connecting to on-premises resources or resources at AWS or Google or something like that? Yeah, unfortunately, um, you know, there's there's nothing built in to kind of make that easy. Uh, you know, when when we're in that world, uh, we're back to still maintaining and managing that kind of token. Um, the, the way that I've worked around that, uh, it's, well, it's not really a workaround, but it's really just put those values somewhere else, uh, usually something like Azure Key Vault, okay. but then I use a managed identity to read those values from Azure Key Vault, right? Okay. So that way, uh, I don't have to keep, you know, the, the keys to the kingdom in in one place, right? Uh, I've, I've definitely seen, uh, people before who, uh, you have an application that needs to read values from Azure Key Vault, and then they have a the password to read those values. Well, if you get access to that password, to that you know that connection string to get to it, then you get access to everything that's in that Key Vault. And yeah. you know, going back to that whole blast radius thing we were talking about, that's that's the that's the really bad scenario. Yeah, that's the keys to the kingdom there. Um, I, as a developer, does it change the way that I write my code if I'm using managed identities versus if I'm just using passwords and secrets and um, connection strings? It does. It does a little. Um, so, yeah, so everything we've been talking about is just how it works. But on the development side, um, you know, you, you actually code it a little differently. So, you know, if you're used to, let's say, using a connection string, um, you know, you, you write out your code and you say, you know, I'm going to connect, I'm going to create a new client to connect to my Azure blob storage. And you just plop in a, a connection string. And that, that connection string has a couple of things, right? It has your secret um, access token. It also has the endpoint of, of that blob storage that you're connecting to. But for something like a managed identity, you need to use a, a different object that will manage that token. And so uh, if you're, let's say, a C Sharp developer like myself, uh, you would go ahead and use um, actually one of two different classes. Uh, you have the, uh, ooh, uh, I'm bad at names. I always have to look this up. Default uh, default access token, default Azure token. That's the word default in it. And I want to oh, say. I have, uh, <laughs> actually have your slides up here. Uh, so there's a default Azure credential. Yeah, there we go. That's it. Thank you for having that up. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I got, I got <laughs> I it from you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, again, with the whole, you know, blog part, right? To, to remind yourself, yeah. Yeah, so default Azure credential. Um, and so the way that that works is in your code, you would new up an instance of that object uh, and then basically pass that into whatever uh, client you want to connect to for for uh, for an Azure service. So an example, uh, talking about like our, our blob storage, right? So I would say, you know, var my client equals new 
blob storage client and in parentheses you type new default Azure credential. So that being the default, so so the default Azure credential there is actually doing a lot of work for you. Mm -hmm. So it has a list of a bunch of different sources of where it's going to go ahead and get your access credentials from. So when your app is running in Azure, it's just running through that same list and say, to say, okay, do I have a valid token from this thing? No. Do I have a valid token from this? No. Do I have a valid token from this? Yes. I'm going to go ahead and use it. Um, for performance reasons, it's it's more recommended that if you know which sources you want to use, you just disable the ones you're not using. Um, or that's where you can use the uh, the other one, the uh, chained token credential. Uh, that one's the the buildup. So instead of so where default it's here's all of the sources. Turn off the ones you're not using. Chained is here's an empty list. Just add the ones that you are using. So same uh, concept, just you know, different way of thinking, right? Uh, so the uh, latter one sounds more secure. Uh, you're uh, you're explicitly giving permissions <laughs> rather than opening door to everyone and having to remember what to close. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if I would say more secure, but it's definitely, it, it, it seems, definitely seems... It seems more zero trust. Uh, it seems to align more with the whole <laughs> idea of zero trust. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, so those sources, in terms of like where it's loading from, are very explicit. So, um, you know, the examples are uh, managed identity if you're running in Azure. But if I'm running on my local machine as a developer... I, I'm not, I don't have a managed identity, right? I can't just get that value. Mm -hmm. And so that's where that list of sources comes from. I so uh, one of those lists of sources is the uh, Azure CLI or or PowerShell, right? Because normally as a, as, as a developer working with Azure services on my local machine, I'm going to be signed into at least one of those two, right? Um, there's a whole list of other uh, sources too, like Visual Studio, environment variables, all of those kinds of things. And so... Um, so as a developer, what I usually do when I'm working um, with uh, managed identities for an app that would be deployed is on my local machine, I am signed into the Azure CLI. And so when the app runs, it just loads my credentials from the CLI and uses those to connect to you know whatever services I'm using. Now, that does mean that there's an extra step of I, Al, do have to have the permissions to do whatever it is the app needs to do, right? So the example being, um, you know, uh, for local development, if I'm talking to uh, Azure Key Vault or, you know, Blob Service, the thing we keep going back to, um, I have to have those permissions to read from that service, right? Um, just like when the app is deployed, the managed identity has to be the thing that has those uh, permissions to go ahead and read from whatever service, uh, you know, we're trying to talk to. Okay. Um, one of the frustrations that I have, because I have the same issue you have that I have to relearn these things if I don't, unless I'm using them every day. Uh, but mm -hmm. one of the frustrations I have is I look for code samples online to connect to something like blob storage or a cosmos or whatever. And the, they, the examples, the code samples almost never use managed identities. They almost always default to using connection strings, which I think we've already decided is not optimal. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. Um, you know, I, I put a lot of blame there on on Microsoft in the early days um, where originally when, uh, you know, originally when Azure came out. Right. It was basically all connection strings. Right. Using these secrets. Uh, and then over time, uh, they, they started getting better about using examples and kind of forcing, you know, use a, a service principle of, of some kind. Uh, and then after uh, managed identities came out and were released as a thing, uh, they were not supported everywhere for every service. Nowadays, though, just about every service uh, does use managed identities or will you work with that. So that's great. Um, and I have actually noticed that recently Microsoft's documentation has gotten a lot better by defaulting to showing you the managed identity version of the code. I think I've seen a few places where you might even actually be able to you know, you know, click a button and say, uh, hey, I know you're showing me the managed identity, but I still have a connection string, so show me that version. But it is defaulting to using hmm. you know, the, the managed identity version, which is nice. It's, it's great that that is becoming the default in, in a lot of those docs. It's still not everywhere, yeah. uh, but hey, it's, it's a step, right? It's, it's progress. We'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The early, by the way, the early days when they were doing things, 
the old way, we refer to that as the time before you and I joined. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. That's when things got good. <laughs> um, this is um, this is really interesting things. Is there anything we haven't covered on this topic that um, you feel is critical for people understanding it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the thing that it, that I want to mention about managed identities is that I think that as a developer, it's a lot easier to use that than it is to use a, a to uh, some kind of secret. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's the it's one of those like I need to learn a little bit, and then it's easier, right? So sure. you front load some of that effort, uh, and then as a result, it's it's just so much easier because you know. Like I mentioned, as a developer working on whatever application that has this stuff, I just have to make sure that that service uh, has whatever permission set up for me to connect to it. And so, you know, I can go ahead and create a de, you know dev environment service or a, an L environment, right? Just me, the developer, working on this. Even though we have a whole team of people, right? It's easy for me to just go in uh, to Azure, make that service, and then I can go ahead and use it and then give me permissions and then everyone else can go ahead and do that. Right. And then we don't even have the temptation to commit any kind of sources. Um, you know, I don't have someone asking me in the team chat, uh, Hey, it, does anyone have uh, an updated uh, connection string to this service? Uh, just so that way I can go ahead and, and jump in real quick. Like, no, no, it's. Oh yeah. Teams by the way won't add... let you do that either. It'll block mm -hmm. a message oh. that has a connection string in it. Oh, that's good to know. I yeah, I've yeah, tried it right. before, and it, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, you have to uh, you have to trick it. <laughs> <laughs> of of course, oh, great. Um, yeah, but yeah, I I think that you know from a development perspective, that once you get to that mindset, it is a lot easier uh, to to work with it from from that from so, from that mindset. Yeah. So the complexity you talked about earlier, that's an investment upfront that saves mm -hmm. you a lot of the the complexity and trouble down the road, like a lot of things mm -hmm. if you've. Uh, if you invest more time up front, then you'll save it in the long run. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's the the lovely shift left, right? Shift do, left, exactly. do more work now, so you do a lot less later. Unfortunately, we keep shifting everything left, so now you're you're doing like every single thing now, and then very little later. So that's, uh, it just it just feels like more and more work. <laughs> where do uh, where do people go to learn more about this? Yeah, uh, so Microsoft actually has some decent information um, on their their blogs or their uh, docs website, which is good because it's a Microsoft only technology. Um, so yeah, if you just go ahead and search "manage identities," um, and you know what, I uh, should probably have been a little more prepared for that answer. Oh, that's so right. I'm going to go ahead and look this up. You can look it up, or you can send it to me. I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> oh, that is great. Yeah, so I'm just searching Azure Managed Identity so am I. in my. Uh, browser of or my uh, search engine of choice. And uh, yeah, I think that the very first uh, link that came up uh, is from the, uh, you know, learn.microsoft.com. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and send you that link. So you Perfect. can include that in the show notes. Um, but that is a great start. Uh, there's a little video too. You can watch it. Uh, and I'm sure that they're going to have, uh, you know, a better description with diagrams and all that fun stuff to, to make it easier to, to visualize. Yeah. Sounds great. We're a visual group here at Technology and Friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, before you go, um, I understand you have a podcast. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've, I've been doing a uh, Marvel-themed podcast for, uh, I guess, I guess I'm at seven years now. Wow. Um, yeah, so my friend, uh, guy, uh, great guy that I've, I've been friends with since uh, elementary school, he, uh, he tricked me. Uh, he <laughs> said, hey, Al, do you want to do a Marvel podcast with me? And I said, yes. And he just he knew he knew exactly how to trick me into joining him. <laughs> um, so it's yeah yeah so it, uh, it is specifically um, the movie. So it's the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, we are going through and watching every single thing uh, within the within the MCU. So that mm -hmm. is um, all of the movies, all of the TV shows, uh, which does include a lot of TV shows that they sort of kind of like to ignore nowadays. <laughs> you know, um, so Agents of Shield is one of my absolute all-time favorites. Uh, and so we, we've spent a lot of time uh, talking about that show, all of that. And uh, if you if you do want to go ahead and give it a listen, um, do not start uh, at the beginning because we were very bad when we first started. We just were <laughs> not we good start? with podcasting. Yeah, start like, uh, and give it like 200 episodes in. Whoa, how, already many, pretty how far. many episodes do you have? 
Um, we are at uh, we are past 350 at this point. Yeah. How, how do I find it? Uh, so you, if you search for mcurewind.com um, MCU or, or just search mcurewind.com. Yes. Uh, yeah, so that'll pull up our website. Uh, we, we try to publish uh, our podcast to um, as many podcast sources as available, uh, except for YouTube. We are an audio only, uh, and it just never occurred to us to think, oh, we, we should we should probably push this to YouTube also. <laughs> so maybe one day we'll remember to do that. I've seen people just put a static image mm-hmm. and audio over that and publish that to YouTube. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that too. I uh, it's it's a level of work that gets more and more each time, right? So, no, so I we'll probably that. start with just newer episodes when we get around to thinking about that. As yeah. a creator <laughs> of content that generates zero revenue, I understand exactly <laughs> what you are saying. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, yeah. Al, thank you so much. This has been really interesting, and I've, I've learned a lot from you. I appreciate it. Oh, great. It's been so much fun. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I've definitely learned uh, in my career is that working with technology is a team sport, sometimes a full contact sport, which you know, depending on the week, that 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 can that can leave you hurting. Uh, but you know, team sports are always better with friends.